Sherwood Rowland. Boy, am I happy to have Sherwood here. Uh, Sherwood is, um, is in great demand as a lecturer and speaker, and in, in particular at, at large scientific meetings like this. I, I wouldn't say I would have had a fist fight with the uh, Division of Physical Chemistry, but it was close. Um, everyone knows Sherwood uh, was, a role, uh, was awarded the uh, Nobel Prize in uh, Chemistry for the elucidation of uh, uh, the degradation of uh, chlorofluorohydrocarbons uh, in the atmosphere and how chlorine was released and attacked the ozone. And that, that was a, a monumental discovery. And, and it wasn't actually a discovery. It was after a lot of hard, good scientific work because nobody really understood what was going on up there. And uh, another aspect was doing analytical chemistry in the atmosphere it would make you run screaming from the room. Uh, it was an exceedingly important discovery that if, if left alone, if the, the ozone blanket of the Earth had been depleted, it would adversely affect the plant life on this planet. And you let that sink in a little bit, it gets very serious very fast. Uh, I know that currently Sherwood is uh, interested in the uh, uh, impact of uh, methane on global warming. And I've heard that he's interested in uh, uh, the role that jet airplane emissions have on the atmosphere. So I'm very happy to have you here, sir. Uh, <clears throat> the starting point for me in discussing uh, greenhouse gases is the experimental work by uh, Dave Keeling from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, who started out in the, the, the question about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere had been discussed for, for probably 100 to 150 years. But nobody had done a precision measurement uh, in such a way that you could establish that it was changing, that the concentration was changing. Uh, that, that required a certain amount of persistence in choose, choosing where you get located. And Keeling started in 1958 during the International Geophysical Year by establishing two stations, one at, on the side of the Mauna Loa in Hawaii and the other at the South Pole. Both of these stations chosen in such a way that they were uh, distant from major sources of carbon dioxide. And even in Mauna Loa, he has to uh, reject when they have upsweep, upsweep <coughs> coming off the island, but it's a volcano and they're up on the side of it. So this is the, 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 about the time that the measurements of Keeling established. They, the, the two things, the first thing that, that he established was quickly shown right over here, uh, that it wasn't, that the concentration wasn't the same throughout the year, that there was a seasonal effect the seasonal effect is composed of uh, increases in concentration from decomposition of the molecule of uh, organic matter that releases CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, the, the diminution uh, is during the spring and the summer with the green plants growing uh, all, all over the northern hemisphere and ex uh, taking CO2 out the, and driving the concentration down. And so this is 1958, uh, starts down in May, turns around in November, uh, and comes back up, goes down, and rises in May, goes down in November. And as you follow it along, at some point along here, most, for most people it was somewhere out in here, I think, they say this, he's been measuring it long enough and with accuracy enough to say that it's actually increasing. Uh, and so what you see is that over the course of this period of a dozen years, that the concentration went from about 315 to 325 uh, parts per million. And uh, that uh, established that something was uh, contributing to uh, the, the alternation of the cycle. And that is the burning of fossil fuels of burning coal, gas, and oil, and increasing amounts, and faster than the ocean takes, takes it up from there. 
seen a fight. Uh, and uh, by 1986, for instance, uh, this is Newsweek, and talking, there was testimony in, in the middle 80s uh, about ozone loss and global warming. Uh, more, much, more, much more about uh, ozone loss in terms of doing uh, uh, some action about it. But uh, global warming was un under consideration. And uh, 10 years later, in 2006, uh, there, was, there was much more concern about it. And uh, here is in 2007, where the, the Newsweek article says global warming is a hoax. But then if you took down, look down here, it says, or so claim well-funded naysayers who still reject the overwhelming evidence of climate change. And over the course of the last few years, uh, there's been, uh, I think, coalescence and agreement about the IPCC and its, uh, that is, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and uh, their statements that uh, the atmosphere is actually changing, the amount of carbon dioxide uh, is going up, and that there will be climatic consequences from that. The, the uh, question of comes up then about greenhouse effect, and the idea of the greenhouse effect uh, is, is simply that there is an interception of outgoing radiation from the Earth by molecules that are able to, to absorb the infrared in the region of the infrared where uh, the, the, the radiation is escaping from the Earth. Well, the natural greenhouse effect is about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and that was, that's a calculation that if you take as a model of the radiation coming in from the sun, you need almost uh, a, a balance. You need a balance of energy going out. And you calculate uh, from well-known physical per physics principles of what temperature would be required for the Earth to do that. Uh, and that would be zero degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, but that's the, the key assumption there is that if all the radiation that's going out it actually escapes. And the, the greenhouse effect is saying that that's, that's an assumption that is not true and that which uh, is rather that there, is, there are regions in the wavelengths of the radiation going out uh, where molecules in the atmosphere are absorbing that radiation and with the result that what one needs to have is uh, more radiation going starting out from the surface so that the amount that survives and escapes balances the amount that's coming in. So that's, that's the basic physics pr principle of the greenhouse effect. And uh, then it simply the question of what are the molecules or what, are the, what, what is it that will actually absorb some of this radiation. And this turns out to, to then to define what the greenhouse gases are. And the greenhouse gases are the ones that have infrared spectra in, these, in this radiation, uh, in this level of radiation here. Let's see. And uh, it's, it's fairly quick to summarize what you need to do to be a greenhouse gas. Uh, and that's to have three atoms or more. Uh, the diatomic molecules don't absorb in that region. Most polyatomic, mole most polyatomic molecules where you have more than two, uh, and so you, you end up that it's molecules like carbon dioxide, methane, N2O, ozone, water vapor, even the CFCs, uh, but not carbon monoxide, nitrogen, and oxygen. So it is these molecules uh, that you have to look at the atmosphere do. And uh, then I, uh, I will say at least that the summary of the understanding uh, reached the Supreme Court a year ago. And in the first paragraphs of the decision that they made, uh, which said that carbon dioxide was 
uh, interpretable as a as a pollutant. Uh, and it, what uh, <coughs> Justice C. Stevens said was a uh, well-documented rise in global temperatures, a significant increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that respected scientists believe that the two trends are related, and that in fact uh, this increase here is the cause of, of the temperature. Uh, and that was uh, that's the Supreme Court uh, statement or ruling there has not yet been acted upon, but it, but it was uh, well publicized at the time. And so let's examine those, uh, those three statements. Uh, the first one is the measurement of global temperature change. And the change over the period of time uh, of roughly 100, 120 years uh, is about one degree centigrade, uh, most of which uh, has come really in, say, the last 40 or 50 years. And so that's, that's the temperature change. This is uh, Keeling's measurements uh, extended from this original number, which went out to 1970. And you can see that, it, that this, you, uh, essentially that oscillation back and forth in Hawaii, and there's no, very little oscillation at the South Pole because the South Pole is 90%, the Southern Hemisphere is 90% water, and uh, for that reason uh, isn't in, involved in, in photosynthesis to the extent of the Northern Hemisphere. So, uh, the, and the radiation uh, just climbs up here, and uh, on this, this curve was the last curve that, Wheeling, that uh, Keeling put out before he, he died in 2000. And, uh, five, uh, it, it is con being continued by people at Scripps and, and being run by his son, who is a distinguished atmospheric scientist, Ralph Keeling. But, but just to uh, add to it here that the May, eight, May 2008 value was 388 parts per million. So there it was off, it's off the scale here. Uh, but of course, May is the high part of it. But it, if you look at the back start back here, what you see is that you were going up at a little less than one part per million uh, through the 60s. Uh, now you're going up at about two parts per million per year. Uh, and if, if you read what people are saying, what the, the quote, danger uh, level would be, is the lowest one that I have seen where people say real worry is, 150, is 450 parts per million. Well, 450 parts per million uh, is uh, out at about 2030. Uh, so it, it's something that, that we will uh, get to uh, very soon, well, almost certainly, because uh, I haven't seen anything where, uh, in which you have sources of CO2 that are going to be discontinued. But most of the discussions of alternate energy sources are uh, alternate energy sources are not to replace the, the ones that exist, but rather they're to replace uh, the ones that you might have might have added. Uh, so that would that would what that would do is level this off at two parts uh, per million increase uh, each year. And the other, the final and the third argument uh, part of that argument is that there are there is absorption uh, and the. the by, of the infrared, and this is uh, a, a, an infrared spectrometer on a satellite looking down at the Sahara Desert uh, at noon, and what one sees is that the temperature of the surface of, was 117 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're getting radiation uh, that comes from that in this transparent region here. But over here where carbon dioxide is absorbing, uh, very substantial amounts of radiation have been absorbed. Uh, and so what you, what you need to do by this satellite measurement is measure all over the world because it depends on the temperature of the, of the Earth uh, down here. Uh, but you can see that, in fact, uh, there is radiation getting out, seeing all the way down, uh, but there's also uh, many wavelengths where it's not getting escaping. Oh, and that's, that, so that establishes 
Well, the third thing that, in fact, the carbon dioxide is involved in preventing the radiation from escaping. Well, uh, where, where do, do we start to figure in this? Well, uh, we started measurements in uh, 1978, going to north, both northern and southern hemisphere, uh, and we were we wanted uh, to have air samples from uh, to look, look for a particular uh, chlorinated molecule, methyl chloroform, which we thought and which are could use to evaluate how long hydrocarbons or substitute uh, CFCs uh, would last in the atmosphere. But that needed, meant we needed to have measurements in both hemispheres. And so what we did was to take uh, <coughs> stainless steel canisters uh, that are uh, uh, evacuated in the laboratory and taken to various locations uh, all, all over the Pacific, from northern Alaska to southern New Zealand. And we've been doing that effectively now uh, since 1978, so for 30 years, uh, and looking at what increasingly closely at the molecules that are involved in that. And uh, one of them that we, we saw right away uh, was an interesting molecule, was methane. Uh, and uh, this is, these are measurements made in January of 1980, uh, there is more methane in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere, and, and that's true at all times. Uh, and the question of where, what, is, what are the sources of methane, well, there are, uh, unlike the carbon dioxide where you can quickly say burning of coal, gas, and oil, and you've accounted for 85% of the CO2, when you start asking about methane, you find there are 10 or a dozen different sources that are contributing. Rice paddies during the time that they are uh, wet are regions in which uh, the <coughs> methane is coming up through the, the, the stems and escaping to, to the atmosphere. Uh, the, another source is our cattle. Uh, and all of the other uh, animals like that, uh, like yaks and so on, that have uh, complicated stomachs so they can digest cellulose. Well, in the process, uh, the, the average typical cow gives off about a half a pound of methane a day. Uh, and uh, multiply that by 1.6 billion cattle, and that becomes an important con contributor. And if you uh, keep uh, Looking at various sources for methane, uh, enteric fermentation are the cattle, the gas production, coal mining, landfill, biomass burning, the, the burning of waste, agriculture, or of trees uh, is an important source, the rice paddies. And then the ones in yellow are the ones that would be there or that are not being manipulated by humans. The ones in red are the ones where are human activities are affecting it. And though, so it says methane is relatively complicated. Uh, and uh, but what you could see is that between January of 1980 and December of 1987, there was a real jump of amount of methane in the atmosphere everywhere from Alaska to the South Pole. And in fact, what you see is the Southern Hemisphere is pretty thoroughly mixed and uh, there's, it, it comes down some of it's coming down from the north, and it gets rather thoroughly mixed down here. So there was, at this particular time, there was no difference in the methane concentration from Guadalcanal, which is somewhere in here, to, all the way to the South Pole. And uh, we've been, as I say, we've been making measurements like this over the time period for of uh, every three months since the early 1980s. Well, the question of energy sources that are involved uh, because ultimately climate change begin, becomes an energy source question. That's the coal and the oil and the natural gas. Uh, where the, the most carbon comes from coal, because the carbon is the only thing that's contributing. Oil has uh, uh, also has hydrogen being burned, and natural gas has even more hydrogen being burned. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, 
the carbon ends up as CO2 and the CO2 ends up staying in the atmosphere. And this, these are the uh, future estimates uh, for the year 2100 of what the contributors would uh, to uh, the greenhouse uh, contribution, uh, positive or negative. And there are, there are two kinds of contributors. Uh, the ones that do it globally because everything is mixed pretty, pretty thoroughly. The others where you need regional measurements of uh, something like tropospheric ozone, which is a contributor, but uh, varies very widely, but whether it's a city or whether you're out in farmland. And, uh, so, but the clear carbon dioxide is a big part of the problem, but the others include methane and N2O and fluorocarbons uh, as, because these are polyatomic molecules that, that do absorb uh, that infrared radiation. What you can see is that CO2, as they say, is the big, the big problem. Methane uh, is number two. Uh, N2O, fluorocarbon 12, fluorocarbon 11, and then a mixture of others. But, so it's roughly half CO2 problem, and the other half is all of, uh, all of the rest of the contributors. I, I use this. Uh, illustration is a picture that Lonnie Thompson from Ohio State took in 1977 uh, when he investigated the Kelkaya Glacier in Peru. Uh, the Kelkaya Glacier, the, the Peruvian Andes, uh, have uh, two sources of, of winds and, and they are seasonal. Part of the time it's coming from the, uh, from the Amazon and bringing lots of rain and and part of the time it's coming from the Chilean desert and bringing only dust. And what you can see is that there are layers of dust and ice and dust and ice and dust. And you can count back. And it, it's, this is visually, you can see that there is a record stored in this ice of uh, year by year of things that are in it. And if you look in it uh, and take out an ice core, uh, you're getting a sample of what was there at some earlier age. And uh, in fact, uh, what you, you, re you require roughly 50 meters of ice. Uh, we're pushing down. When the snow falls, it's very loosely packed. But when your ice pulls down on it, it eventually breaks, puts this off into being uh, bubbles that are no longer interconnecting. And the, then it just maintains uh, in the ice core, a sample of air that comes from some past time, depending on how long it took to close it off. And in the case of the Kalkaya Kalkaya Glacier, where you saw it there, the, uh, they had a 1,500 years uh, at that point. Uh, but uh, if you go down to uh, Vostok in Antarctica, where there's much less rain and snow, uh, you go far, much further back in time, and here is a measurement then that goes back uh, 150,000 years. Uh, and you got, you know, this, this is modern day over here. Uh, and what you see is that the amount of methane varied from around 700 uh, parts per billion to 350 parts per billion for what's shown here is uh, 150,000 years but which is actually now there's a, a, a record that goes back uh, beyond 500,000 years. And it varies that much, but this is where we are. Uh, having gone this way for 450,000 years, uh, then we w went to a point where methane shot up at a level that hadn't been seen anywhere in that time period. These are the, and the, this is the temperature as inferred by, from the isotopes that are there. So this is a, a warming period much like this. Uh, and CO2 went back and forth between 280 and 190. Uh, and again, CO2 is now at 380. So uh, we're in a in time period where nothing, uh, there's nothing like it in uh, going back uh, as far. This is the, now the 420,000 years. And you can see that variation is carried back uh, through a long period of time 
again, carbon dioxide uh, didn't get above or a little, around 300. And to, uh, just to, as to remind you that what happened uh, in that time period, uh, say 20,000 years ago, there was a mile of ice on, on Canada and on the United States in the, the upper northwest, the northeast of the United States. Uh, and the result was that there's, there's, the oceans were 400 meters uh, less uh, deep than they are now. And that made so that uh, Siberia and Alaska were interconnected and other changes. Uh, uh, England was not an island and uh, that would be uh, and you can see here that, uh, it, again, that the, the, the coastline was extended out on the continental shelf because the, the, there was no, uh, because, of, because it was all on the, in the ice. On There are some uh, effects, uh, feedback effects that, are, that uh, are observed. And one of these is that, uh, as the temperature goes up of the ocean, the vapor pressure goes up, and you expect to have more water in the atmosphere. And uh, so that that by itself is is a uh, a feedback effect. It's uh, worth pointing out that there is also a rea a physical reaction in which uh, is that if you trace the origin of hurricanes back uh, to where they start, you always find the water temperature of 81 degrees Fahrenheit or, or greater. And so the uh, doesn't mean that if you have 81 degree water, you get a hurricane. But if you don't have it, you don't get a hurricane. And so the question becomes one, this has to do with getting water evaporated fast enough such that when it gets into the atmosphere and then condenses, releases a lot of energy into the, into the hurricane itself. Uh, well, the question, uh, so one can expect, uh, at least it be reasonable hypothesis, that if your 81 degree water is now 82 degree water, uh, you're going to get maybe more frequent hurricanes or maybe more intense. Uh, so far, the evidence is not clear, uh, but the, but perhaps that the, the intensity might might be uh, correct there. Uh, another albedo effect, uh, which uh, affects particularly the northern part of uh, uh, North America and Europe and so on, uh, and that is that when the when you have ground that's covered by snow, uh, then uh, you're reflecting roughly 80 percent of the radiation coming in. Uh, but if you melt the snow, then you uh, reflect a very much smaller fraction of it. Uh, and that's the same, same thing, same direction and about the same amount, uh, that when you melt the ice, uh, water absorbs much better than, than the ice, and the ice which is reflecting 80%. So one of the effects that you would expect then is that either is melting of snow and melting of ice, that in the northern hemisphere, uh, that effect should be kicking back in. And uh, in fact, there we are. Uh, this is a model uh, of, the, of the calculation into the future. This was as uh, looked at in 1995. Uh, it said if you went to doubled carbon dioxide, the place where you would see the temperature great, greatest, change, the change in the temperature greatest would be in the, uh, the northern uh, region, uh, not in the southern region, the southern region being that, uh, that in Antarctica, most of Antarctica is covered by ice and snow at, to 10,000 feet and is much colder uh, than freezing point. Uh, in the Arctic, uh, there's a lot, there are a lot of places where when you melt the ice, uh, you're exposing water underneath. So th there you have to be somewhere close to the freezing point. And that's expected. So it's not surprising. This is a prediction from 20 years ago. 
that when you did start seeing effects, uh, then it would be in the North Polar region. Oh, and that's, of course, where uh, reports from Alaska and, and the North, uh, generally speaking, that the Arctic is, is showing very large, uh, very sharp increases in, uh, in temperature there. Well, what, other, uh, what are the other consequences that one has? Uh, one of the, this is for the western part of the United States, the circles on this, on this diagram, each, each of these dots and circle represents a, a forest fire uh, in the west during a 30 year period. Uh, the size of the circle uh, is in, in proportion to the number of acres that were burned. Uh, and these are the ones where the, where the snow, fell, snow melt lasted late uh, and so that there was uh, humid, humidity and lower temperatures controlled further into the year. The early snow melt years had all of the big, almost all of the big fires. Uh, one of the expectations, uh, the strongest expectation, is that in, <coughs> in the uh, far west, in the Rocky Mountains, uh, the, the uh, snow line uh, would ex be expected to rise. Uh, that means that met, there will be more melt in the, uh, in the springtime uh, and less surviving for, for the summer use. Uh, and uh, so a very uh, regionally significant uh, effects that would, would, would show up there. Now, now then I'm going to go back to looking at, at the methane uh, results. This, this is a repeat of one that you saw before of uh, the methane in January of 1980. And uh, next one uh, I had once before showing that during this time period, the amount of methane in the atmosphere went up at about 1% a year. Uh, and uh, methane, uh, un CO2 lasts for 100 years or more in the atmosphere. Methane lasts for an average of about eight years. Uh, so it, it, it has lots of sources and a sink of reaction with hydroxyl radical that takes them out. Uh, so, but this just means, for this it means that during that time period, uh, the release of methane uh, overwhelmed the loss of methane uh, by about 1% a year in the total. Uh, well, you can, you can see that it, uh, if you go to December of 93, to then December of 2000, then December of 2004, you can see that the increase was falling off rapidly here. Uh, and in, in fact, uh, you, can, you can make a, an average if you go every uh, as, as we do, we will we, we go uh, every March, June, September, December. Take, take the measurements for, for one set like that, you get a yearly average. Now you drop March and you add the March of the next year, you get another yearly average. So you get one, this rolling one year average. And if you do that rolling one year average, you find out it isn't a steady diminution in, 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 uh, the, in the change there, but rather uh, very sharp gradations that are involved. And the question is what, it is, what is it that caused each of these spikes in here? And uh, as I said earlier, there are lots of sources of methane. Uh, so the question of assigning blame uh, for the changes in the methane is a is a tricky business where you look for other things that would help you on it. And one of the, because we collect canisters that aren't just directed toward methane, we we collect we analyze for 200 different molecules, and but some of them are of direct interest, and in this case in particular. Uh, what we are looking at is whether or not the 
this jump in methane at the end of 1998 or 1997-98, when the methane suddenly jumped up, uh, now ethane went up at the same time. Uh, that's, most of those methane sources don't have ethane going along with it. But biomass burning, uh, the burning of uh, fossil, of <coughs> agricultural waste or trees or so on, uh, that that happened. Uh, this this was when New Zealand, when uh, <coughs> Indonesia was on fire at the, the last part of 1997 and into 1998. And that's because that this looks as though uh, ethane really was being controlled by whatever was controlled methane. Uh, we say that's we say that's pretty certain to be associated with Indonesia. Back here in 19, right here, uh, this one right in here was uh, when the Soviet Union was falling apart. Uh, and their, their industry, the demand for, for natural gas from the Soviet Union, or their ability to provide it, uh, showed a real diminution. So there, uh, there are other, uh, other possible sources of causes in this series of times here, but uh, the, uh, the, 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 I think the one clue that you come from it is that it is possible uh, to, by cure it, by plugging leaks of methane, uh, to make maybe prevent from methane from increasing further from where it is now. Uh, when it, when you had looked only back in here when they were looking in 1980 or 85. Uh, at the time, methane was going up 1% a year, every year. Uh, it would, made sense to extrapolate uh, that into the, into the 2000s. But it doesn't make sense to extrapolate it anymore because you see there's a lot of structure and the average is no longer uh, going, <coughs> going up 1% a year, but has hardly changed. Uh, over the last eight years or so, uh, that, as that that's the that's the uh, rolling one-year average. I I just wanted to say a few other things. One of them is uh, something, the uh, fact that I didn't didn't realize until it was pointed out to me by a person working at Berkeley. Uh, and that is that uh, starting about 1970, the per capita use of electricity in California uh, reached a, a steady state and has stayed that way for, for the last 30 years or more. It didn't, it, the, that's the line here, the per, per capita use of electricity. Uh, for the, the rest of the United States, uh, went right on up. Uh, this was a, this is a combination of regulations and fiscal policies, and and in some cases choosing to do something that is not, if you're not choosing your electricity source, chose a certain um, not choosing it by what's cheapest, but by putting in some other uh, criteria like uh, efficiency and so on. And so it says that there there are obviously room in the rest of the United States for adopting some of the, uh, or many of the things which have proven to be uh, useful, but it does mean in some cases it's going to cost more. Uh, well, what are the uh, some other aspects of uh, climate change? Uh, this is a tidal barrier that was built in the 80s um, uh, into the, when when the wind uh, storm surge starts to go back up the Thames toward uh, London, uh, they just close these off and uh, prevent the surge the surge from getting up to downtown London. Well, the number of times that they've used that in the 80s was very small. The number of times used in the 2000s. Uh, had had uh, got a, a much higher. They don't count. They 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 do open these uh, on on certain occasions or close them 
off for tests and everything, but these are the ones they closed off because of the, the concern about a possible storm surge coming up. If you have a one meter rise in sea level, uh, then which is on the upper range uh, of the expectation for the year 2100, then uh, one is looking at uh, <coughs> flooding of, of much of South Florida and in the, uh, in the New, or New Orleans and uh, across through, through that region as well. Uh, and in Bangladesh is much worse uh, because this is a very low-lying country for so this is the part where one meter sea level rise would, would do to Bangladesh, which is, this is where um, 100 million people live. I'll skip there. Well, the, no, this is, this is the growth in emissions of carbon dioxide. The Kyoto Protocol uh, was based on uh, 1990, and uh, the only, if you, if you look closely, the only countries there that really met uh, their, their, the uh, goal for Kyoto uh, were Russia and Latvia, and that all was that was all because of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, USA up 20 percent, uh, rather rather than we didn't we never signed, of course, but uh, and it, and other people, uh, Japan and Canada and Italy. Uh, they were uh, the, having trouble meeting the, the Kyoto Protocol as well. So uh, we're getting in, into a situation now that we have uh, the Kyoto Protocol runs out in 2012. Question of what should replace it. The protocol by itself was not very effective, uh, and it certainly not wasn't going to be very effective if India and China and the U.S. weren't involved. Uh, but uh, it's going to be even more complicated now because uh, the problem is, is ex uh, extensively worse than it was uh, when the Kyoto Protocol was approved or, or set up at 10 years ago. I, I may have had one more, but I think this is a good place to stop and, and just simply say that uh, the greenhouse gas, the problem that started out as being a carbon dioxide problem uh, became a greenhouse gas problem because when you started looking closely, it wasn't just carbon dioxide that was increasing. It was methane. Uh, it was nitrous oxide coming from fertilizer use on, uh, in agriculture. Uh, the water vapor is controlled by the, is a secondary process controlled by the temperature of the ocean. Uh, so essentially all of the greenhouse gases that were there uh, are playing their part. Uh, it, is, it isn't just carbon dioxide, but unless we do something about carbon dioxide, then we will have uh, climate change arriving. Uh, or we're, we're seeing it arrive already in, in Alaska and the far, and the far north, uh, and we can expect it to be uh, showing up other places. There certainly is concern about uh, in Australia that they, uh, the southeastern part of Australia where most of the Australians live has a, is at a 10 year long drought at this point. And so they're, they're and that's, that's not, not uh, it's probably associated with climate change. There, that's, the calculations of the models suggest changes in that regard. So I will stop there and say simply that uh, uh, it's an environmental problem that is uh, getting worse and uh, will need to be some kind of, uh, <coughs> of adjustment in what we do in re in other than simply uh, barrel ahead, uh, to letting the temperature go up uh, to the upper limits of what the IPCC has recommended. Thank you.